Professor Giri Deshankar was a distinguished professor. Also, he was the director of CSDS for five years between 1987 and 1992. Uh, he was uh, one of the founding members of ICS. It started with a small study group, kind of a research program of CSDS, but later on it turned into a full-fledged uh, institute on its own ICS. So we have been organizing this annual lecture in his memory for the last 13 years. So this is the 13th year of that lecture. There is a long list of speakers who have delivered lectures in the past. I don't want to take names of all the people who have delivered lecture. Some of those, uh, some of the names are there in the invitation, but I would like to specially mention uh, the lecture was delivered was Professor Prasenjit Professor Dwara also, who is uh, among the audience. Currently, he is a vesting, he is a Rajni Kothari chair at CSDS. He is, he is among the audience. There are a few other names. Wang Hui, Andrew Nathan, David Sambo. It's a long list of scholars who have delivered lectures in the past. Um, I'm delighted to, in, to welcome today's speaker, Professor Mark C. Elliott, who is a professor of Chinese, Chinese and Inner Asian History in the Department of East Asian Language and Civilization and the Department of History at Harvard University. Uh, since 2015, uh, he is also the Harvard Vice Provost for International Affairs. Uh, today he is going to speak on the historical Silk Road and the Belt and Road Initiative. A brief introduction about the speaker is going to be delivered by the director of ICS, Professor Ashok Kanta. So I would like to invite Professor Ashok Kanta to briefly introduce the lecture, briefly introduce the speaker as well as chair the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, let me also extend uh, a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of ICS, CSTS, and India Interaction Center. As uh, Prof. Sanjay Kumar mentioned, uh, we have gathered for the 13th uh, Giridashin Memorial Lecture by eminent historian and China scholar, Prof. Mark C. Elliott. You know, it's a very special occasion for us. Uh, uh, as Sanjay said, uh, we organize this lecture every year. We started doing that in 2001. And it's meant to be a tribute to Prof. Giri Deshinka, one of our pioneering uh, Chinese scholars, who was much more than uh, a Chinese scholar. Prof. Deshinka was a historian with a deep knowledge of China's history, culture, literature, as also economy, politics, foreign and strategic affairs, who brought uh, a civilizational perspective to the study of China and India. But his uh, preoccupations went uh, well beyond China to include Asia and the Asian identity. And indeed, uh, issues relating to war, peace, and human condition. As uh, Professor Rajni Kothari has mentioned in his foreword to a collection of uh, Professor Giri Deshinka's writings which, brought out, which was brought out uh, a few years ago, Professor Deshinka was a spokesman for basic dissent, an important voice of independent thinking on political issues all the way from disarmament to decentralization. Professor Deshinkar was also a teacher, a teacher of a generation of budding Chinese scholars, many of whom are present here this evening, and he was an institution builder, someone who nurtured both uh, CSTS and ICS. As Sanjay mentioned, he was director of both CSDS and ICS. I would like to especially recall uh, Prof. Giri Deshinkar's role in the launching in 1969 of the China Study Group, where, along with uh, a small band of deeply motivated and passionate 
Chennai scholars and practitioners. He encouraged and inspired this group to meet regularly to exchange ideas and share information on China and sustain China Report, the only academic journal on China in South Asia, of, he was, of which he was the founding editor. It's the CSG, it's from the CSG that uh, ICS emerged later, as Sanjay mentioned, initially as a program as part of CSDS and later as a full-fledged think tank and research institute working on China and East Asia. Later this year, we hope to celebrate this journey and mark the 50th anniversary of the CSG and its successor, the ICS. It's worth noting that China Report, uh, of which uh, Giri was the founding editor, has entered its 55th year this February with the latest issue which came out early this month. And it remains the only peer-reviewed quarterly journal on China and East Asia coming out from India. It's most befitting that we have with us Professor Mark Elliott to deliver the 13th Giridashanka Memorial Lecture. Professor Elliott is an authority on the last four centuries of Chinese history and in particular the Qing period. He's a pioneer of the new Qing history which highlights and explores the imprint of inner Asian traditions upon China's last imperial dynasty and its modern successors. His first book, The Manchu Way, The Eight Banners and Ethnic Identity in Late Imperial China is a pioneering study in the new Qing history. He's also the author of Emperor Qianlong, Son of Heaven, Man of the World, and a large number of scholarly articles on China. He was earlier the director of the Fairbank Center of Chinese Studies at Harvard. Indeed, it's most appropriate that Marx should be delivering this lecture. As I'm told that Qing history was the first love of Professor Giri Deshenka, who couldn't complete his project on the founding of the Qing dynasty because of his many preoccupations and untimely demise. Professor Elliot will be speaking on a fascinating and topical issue, the historical Silk Road and the Belt and Road Initiative. The BRI invokes ancient trade routes cutting across Eurasia and the maritime space. Indeed, Xi Jinping's Chinese dream of great rejuvenation Chinese nation emphasizes continuity with the imperial past. Mark will talk about connections and exchanges along the ancient Silk Road, explore what this historical narrative means for BRI and also look at BRI, the larger geopolitical context. Before I invite Mark, I'll share with you a sad news which he passed on to me this morning. Mark's colleague at Harvard, an old friend of the ICS, an eminent Chinese scholar, Professor Roderick McFargore passed away peacefully in his sleep on 10th evening. He was 88. As uh, Patricia O'Broy mentioned in the mail this morning, it's not just an individual but a generation passing on. Professor McFarkard was a great friend of India. In fact, he was born in Lahore in undivided India and remained you know, passionately interested in India and China all through his life. <coughs> he was an inspiration for a generation of China scholars in India, and he was a great friend of ICS. In fact, I understand that uh, he wished to donate a part of his library to ICS. His scholarship will continue to inspire and shape our understanding of China, including his three volume treatise on the origins of the Cultural Revolution. I'm sure Mark will have more to say on this subject. I will now invite Professor Mark Elliott to deliver the lecture. He has agreed to take some questions after the lecture. Mark. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, before I launch into thank yous uh, and into the 
talk, I, I, I will say just a word or two about Roderick Farquhar, uh, who was uh, my colleague at Harvard for 15 years, uh, and uh, was a former director of the Fairbanks Center, so my, my predecessor as, uh, as Fairbanks Center director. Rod was uh, uh, an extraordinary man uh, who led a quite a remarkable life. He had a military career, he had a career as a journalist, he had a career as a parliamentarian, and then a long career as, as a scholar and as an advisor uh, to uh, many, many students. Uh, he uh, uh, broke the mold in, in many ways, and he was a great figure uh, on the Harvard campus. Uh, his class on the Cultural Revolution was a staple for decades. Uh, and uh, one of those classes that, uh, if you hadn't taken it, you, you, you hadn't really gone to Harvard kind of a class. And uh, many, many times I have run into uh, graduates of the college who uh, remember very fondly uh, having sat through uh, Professor Marfarkar's lectures on the Cultural Revolution. And uh, as I, I, I think uh, he, he even uh, joined them to, to exercise in calling out cultural revolutionary slogans uh, to give them some sense of what it was like. And particularly for younger Chinese coming to Harvard in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, that was something that they maybe had never even heard about. Uh, so that was a revelation to them. Rod was uh, uh, in retirement. Uh, very, f he went back to his roots as, as many, uh, many, many of us do as we as we age. And for him, his roots brought him back to India. And on many occasions, uh, he referred to uh, his time uh, growing up in uh, in, in Lahore. Uh, and to his uh, uh, project, uh, the last project that he was working on, uh, which was a comparative history of India and China, it brought him back to India a few times in the last several years. Uh, I know there are many here in this room who, who knew Rod uh, and, uh, and will miss him, and I just want to say that certainly he will be very much missed uh, at Harvard as well. His passing leaves uh, a very big gap, a very big gap. It's a great honor for me, then, uh, to uh, represent uh, Harvard, in a way, here uh, at the, uh, the 13th Giri Shankar Lecture. It's, it's, it's a, a real privilege and, and a pleasure uh, to be here today. I want to thank uh, CSDS and, and Sanjay Kumar, uh, ICS, uh, and uh, Dr. Ashok Kanta uh, for uh, their, their kind invitation. Uh, I want also to say a special hello to Alka Acharya and the audience who hosted me in my first visit to the ICS a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, again, I'm going to call out uh, my friend and colleague, Prasenjit Dwara, uh, who was here as a visitor in Delhi uh, uh, this, uh, uh, for part of this year. Uh, my topic, the historical Silk Road and the BRI, is a, uh, something of a topical uh, subject to, to speak on. My, my hope is to provide uh, a, some, some context for thinking about how to make sense of the BRI. Perhaps, like me, when you first heard of the, the Belt and Road Initiative, or as it used to be known, the One Belt, One Road, you wondered what it was. And was anybody really going to take it very seriously? It, it seemed a bit of a fantasy of uh, then uh, new president of, of China, Xi Jinping. Uh, we hadn't really taken the measure of, of Xi Jinping yet. Uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative seemed one of a number of, of ideas of, of a very ambitious and grand scale that get floated out every so often uh, by the leadership in China uh, some of the things, some of the ideas stick, some of them don't. Uh, myself, uh, I was uh, rather dubious of the prospects of something uh, that uh, uh, had to do with uh, reviving the Silk Road. Uh, and clearly I was very wrong uh, about that. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has proved to be uh, not an unqualified success, but definitely I think we would put it in the success column. Five, six years later, uh, we are still talking, we still hear a lot about the BRI. A whole institutional infrastructure is springing up around the world uh, to study uh, 
the new Silk Road, to study the VR, the latest one in Cairo, uh, established uh, just a, a week or so ago. Uh, and there are institutes and programs for the Belt, Road, Belt and Road Initiative uh, growing up uh, all over the place. Uh, clearly, uh, this is an idea that uh, has captured the imagination of many, many people, and therefore deserves our attention, those of us who pay who pay heed to the role that China plays and will continue to play in, in world affairs, and to try to understand that uh, in, uh, in a full context uh, and in a scholarly framework. So that is the spirit that has animated my uh, entry into this. Uh, I am uh, not by any strict means uh, a scholar of the Silk Road cultures. I, I don't read Saudian, for instance. Uh, to carry an A and B are as mysterious to me as I suspect they are to you. Uh, I do, however, study the long interactions between sedentary and nomadic civilizations in uh, East and Central Asia, what we'd like to call it Harvard Inner Asia. Uh, and it is there, in fact, that a big part of the Silk Road story, uh, I think, can be told. And so it's that uh, that has brought me into, uh, into, this, uh, into this question. <coughs> So let me begin with a, a few remarks about the BRI. Uh, it started out, as I say, uh, as One Belt, One Road. Ida Ilu was the name, and uh, the name came from the uh, uh, idea that there would, was going to be a new Silk Road economic belt and a new maritime Silk Road. So, Xin Silu Jinji Dai and Xin Silu Hai Shan Silu. These were the ideas. He took the idea of a that, a belt, uh, or a zone, if you like. Although belt seems to be the word that has been latched on to in English, and root for road, and you get one belt, one road. It started out uh, as uh, uh, this idea of a new silk road. And so my basic question tonight that I'll be trying to uh, explore with you is what the relationship is of this new silk road to the old silk road. Uh, what does this Silk Road really have to do with the Belt and Road Initiative, after all? Uh, it's uh, something I have been thinking about for, for a while, and again, I'm very, very happy to have the opportunity to, to present uh, some, some of these thoughts with you. Uh, I do think, in fact, there are some deep connections to the Silk Road on a couple of different levels, as I hope to show you. They're not the connections, however, that I think the Chinese government program would like us to have. Uh, and uh, so there may be something slightly, uh, slightly subversive in these remarks. But if I weren't slightly subversive, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror in the morning and call myself a scholar. Now put on. So we start out with One Belt, One Road, Obor. I think maybe people didn't like the... Uh, the sound of Obor in English, and so uh, in 2016 they changed the uh, official English name of uh, Ita Ilu uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, and it's as the BRI that we now regularly refer to uh, uh, Ita Ilu. But you should note that the Chinese name for this has never changed. It has always been Ita Ilu. Uh, but really the main audience, uh, I think, for Itai Ilu has always, in fact, been an external audience for China. Certainly Chinese people in, in China are aware of Itai Ilu, but this is really more uh, an, uh, a program for uh, export. It includes a vast number of countries. You'll see many different numbers, 65, 72. I pulled 81 out of a, a more recent uh, summary of all the countries that have signed up in one way or another. Uh, for the Silk Road. Uh, the price tag on all the different Silk Road projects that uh, uh, have been proposed or have been contemplated in one fashion or another comes to a trillion dollars US. So that's a lot of money and when you put that much money on the table people start to pay attention. Right? So that is uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and as I say it seems to be with us. It seems to not be going away countries, including India, are going to need to figure out what to do, how to position themselves uh, with respect to the Belt and Road Initiative, 
The United States, too, is certainly feeling the pressure uh, and uh, has responded in, uh, in some fashion or other. That's not part of my topic tonight. Um, let me also point out that my emphasis will be exclusively on the continental Silk Road. So I will be talking about the, um, uh, the overland routes. I will not be talking about the maritime Silk Road. Perhaps if there is time in the Q&A, we can, we can talk about that. Some slides for those of you who have uh, not uh, uh, picked up a newspaper in the last few years. Uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, includes uh, pretty much all the countries of uh, 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 Central Asia, uh, many European countries, fair number of countries in, uh, in West Asia, in, uh, in Africa, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, as well as, more recently, not shown on this map, Latin America. Uh, like you, I was, I was quite surprised to learn that the Silk Road had gone to Latin America, historically, but uh, uh, you learn new things every day. Uh, uh, railways are a big part of the Belt and Road Initiative. There's to be a high-speed rail uh, built between uh, uh, London, uh, connecting London and uh, uh, Beijing or Suzhou. Uh, and uh, this has got a lot of people very excited. Uh, part of it is going to be used for transportation of goods, part of it may be for tourists, no one's really sure. When you start looking very closely, the economics of the Belt and Road Initiative don't always add up. Uh, and again, this may be something we can talk about a bit in the q and I'm not an economist, I'm not proposing an economic analysis. Uh, but I will argue here that there's a lot more to the Belt and Road Initiative than just economics. Uh, here you have a, a, a recent update uh, showing where different uh, uh, ports uh, are being built or have been bought, uh, where uh, railroads are going, uh, different kinds of corridors being built, uh, the number of contracts being awarded, uh, uh, altogether to Chinese companies now tallying over 300 billion investments, over 200 billion already made. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the loans that are being used to help build all this infrastructure in different parts of, uh, of the world. Infrastructure that, for sure, is needed badly in many of these places. Uh, some of the loan deals are more carefully thought out than, uh, than others. There's a lot of talk of uh, uh, debt diplomacy, uh, debt trap diplomacy, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, evidence of that most recently in, in Sri Lanka, uh, for example. Uh, and so there's a lot of press, good and bad, about the Silk Road, uh, questions about uh, whether its uh, impact in terms of building all this infrastructure isn't going to have major consequences for the environment. Uh, and do, shouldn't the new Silk Road be uh, a green uh, Silk Road. Uh, there are perceptions, uh, problems of perception uh, about uh, what the, is really on the minds of the Chinese government in building uh, all of this infrastructure, extending all of these loans. Uh, and uh, uh, an eminent uh, colleague at uh, National University of Singapore, uh, his predecessor as head of the Asia Research Institute there, Professor Wang Wu has come out uh, to say uh, there are political problems uh, that will need to be dealt with uh, with regard to, to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it should be said that officially uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is not seen as having any political dimension uh, by uh, those who are the official, the, the spokespeople for uh, Belt and Road. In India, uh, the Belt and Road is controversial because it is often seen as an effort to uh, uh, encircle the country with programs and projects in, in Myanmar, as well as, of course, uh, this corridor in Pakistan and a new big port uh, being built in Gwadar uh, in, uh, in the south. Uh, this has created, of course, uh, political issues for uh, the Indian uh, leadership as well. And all of this really can be wrapped up in terms of rhetoric, questions about whether this is not a, a new kind of colonialism. The fact that when the Chinese took possession of the port of Hamban Tota in Sri Lanka uh, a couple of years ago, the term of the lease was for 99 years, exactly the same length of the lease of the new territories in Hong Kong 
that was signed back in 1898, a lot of people, including uh, many China scholars, uh, could not fail to remark upon the coincidence that the very same length of time was being used for uh, the, uh, the long-term lease of uh, uh, what could be called a concession, uh, if you wanted to think of it that way, and some people do. Uh, so again, these uh, articles, uh, a lot of commentary uh, about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, a new kind of colonialism, uh, unwanted influence, uh, perhaps in some areas, in other places, very welcome investment, uh, and badly needed investment. Uh, so uh, there are two sides to uh, all of that. Uh, Hong Kong has jumped on the uh, Belt and Road uh, bandwagon. Here's a word cloud image in the shape of uh, all those uh, Belt and Road countries. And you can see the very positive associations uh, that are made here. Uh, in the Chinese press, uh, in, in official announcements, uh, you can see here, uh, for those who read Chinese, I, I didn't translate the whole thing, uh, but the Xin Shilu, Xin Mengxiang, the idea here connecting the China dream and the Silk and the New Silk Road here. These are ideas that, that are linked, for sure. Um, and they are linked also historically, the idea that, that this is reviving uh, an old Silk Road, the New Silk Road calling on associations with the historical Silk Road. The idea being that what is being done now is nothing more than a restoration of a historical norm of economic relationships that used to exist, were for various reasons allowed to, uh, to, to go away, to disappear, and are now being revived and renewed. And it's that claim, uh, that claim, a kind of legitimating claim, as I see it, of the Belt and Road Initiative that I want to uh, examine uh, today just a little bit. Again, a lot of the Silk Road, uh, Belt and Road stuff uses pictures of camels on dunes. So if it's not high-speed trains, then it's camels on dunes. So this is one or the other uh, calling up either a bright, modern, uh, futuristic uh, uh, world that uh, will be highly globalized and interconnected on, uh, on Chinese uh, laid rails, uh, or it's uh, a revival of the, the ancient trade routes uh, that inspire so much romance, and I'm going to say more about that a little bit. So really the first question then to ask is, what was the old Silk Road? About the new Silk Road, what was the old Silk Road about? And where did the idea of the Silk Road even come from? Surely this is an idea that we find uh, described at length in ancient Chinese chronicles or histories. Uh, that then has uh, come out uh, in, uh, through the work of uh, scholars uh, reading those texts. But in fact, uh, the idea of the Silk Road is a European invention. Many of you will know this. Uh, the first time uh, that uh, the term Silk Road is used is in an article uh, that appeared in uh, a, a German a geological journal in 1877, uh, the article by a uh, uh, scholar, uh, Ferdinand von Riesthofen, this picture shown here, uh, and the article uh, was titled uh, On the Central Asian Silk Roads Up Until the Second Century uh, CE in the Transactions of the Geographical Society of Berlin. A long paper uh, he delivered uh, to an audience uh, then. Now, I'm going to spend a little time talking about what's in von Richthofen's paper, because I think it is actually quite relevant and helpful for us to understand what he meant by the Silk Road and how he came up with this idea in the first place. Von Richthofen didn't know Chinese. Uh, he was able to gain access to Chinese texts through translations, uh, but he was not a scholar of China, he was not a historian, uh, he was a geographer, so he really came to the idea of the Silk Road through geography, primarily and ancient texts, mainly European texts, a few Chinese texts. He was inspired by some of the uh, explorations that had begun in the uh, middle 19th century, uh, this the, the early days, if you will, of, of the Great Game, which will be a story to everybody in this room. Uh, and uh, he was looking for evidence of connections going back into the ancient past 
uh, across uh, Central Asia. He was looking to try and understand how people and ideas and things moved across these, uh, these vast territories. Uh, and he began with landforms. You can see the way that he uh, put this, uh, giving a character to the land, looking at the way he writes today, we might think of him as an environmental historian of sorts, if not an environmental determinist, uh, in, uh, insofar as he ascribes great power to the ability of steppes or deserts or mountains to shape human history. So in this way, uh, he was uh, kind of ahead of his time, if you like, uh, and uh, partly for that reason, I think this essay uh, repays a careful reading. Uh, and he notes that uh, movements of people were limited uh, by various geographic features, uh, and that the only people who moved in large numbers were the nomads, and sedentary people generally stayed put where they were. Uh, and he came up with the idea that uh, in various parts of Central Asia, and most notably the Tarim Basin, you had an ancient equivalent of the Mediterranean. So he was thinking in, a, in an analogy uh, of, of uh, the Mediterranean there in the Tarim Basin, which in fact had been a sea, uh, and that there were towns scattered around the edge of the, the basin. Uh, the, this is the Taklamakan Desert, uh, much as we have towns scattered around uh, the edge of the Mediterranean. And there was a lot, there were trade networks a la Henri Pirenne, that link those, uh, those cities and oases together, much as the cities of uh, the Mediterranean basin also formed a, a, a network. And this seemed to him to be logical because the only way people could move around the desert was around the edges. So he deduced this from geography, not from texts that he had read. He supposed that this probably was the case. And... Uh, he thought of the Tower Basin as a kind of collecting point. Uh, people would come in, they would move around a bit, like in a washing machine, and then they would, they would move out again in various directions. And this kind of vortex uh, powered uh, the movement of people and, and of goods uh, in the Central Asia region more broadly for most of antiquity, up until, say, in this article, the second century. He never wrote a second article to take the story from the second century CE uh, to, say, 1000 CE. Others ended up doing that uh, for him. He talked about trade, he talked about movement of people, and he also talked about movement of goods. And uh, he thought that the movement of goods was very dependent upon political power. Again, he is simply deriving these conclusions from his own experience as a European, not basing this necessarily on uh, anything, uh, any, any research. Uh, and that uh, uh, some people are better traders than others. He didn't know who these people were. We didn't yet have that information. He suspected that there were people out there helping to move these goods around. He was right. There were. Uh, but this was, again, something that he was uh, putting forward as a, a hypothesis. And a very important part of his hypothesis was the role of silk in all of that. Few products, he says, played such an important role in all of this as silk, Throughout all antiquity, it was the most important object of the land trade emanating from it. And that silk played a key role in relations between states and, and countries on these routes. Inferred influences, you will know, he, he says here. Inferred influences, again, he is inferring this from what he suspects to have been the case. He divides the period up, up until, from high antiquity up until the, the uh, uh, second century of the Han Dynasty, and then uh, the period following that, after 114 CE, uh, he says, was the time when the Silk Road really went into high gear with the growth of Han Dynasty power uh, around 120 uh, CE, uh, and the connections that were made uh, during the uh, uh, growth of Han, uh, of the Han Empire fighting against the Xiongnu, the uh, nomads of, uh, of, of Inner Asia, uh, which led uh, to this connectivity, this new connectivity uh, across uh, these vast areas of Central Asia. Uh, he says this is the first expedition of the Chinese westward of which we have news. 
So what's he talking about here? He's talking about, of course, the famous Han Dynasty emissary, Zhang Qian, uh, who was sent by uh, Han Wudi, uh, the, the martial emperor of the Han, out westward to the uh, Yuezhi, to the people uh, also known as Kushan, uh, in Bactria, uh, hoping to get their assistance as allies in a military campaign that he hoped to fight against the Xiongnu, the Xiongnu being the uh, martially uh, powerful nomadic confederation on the Han northern border, uh, and uh, against whom uh, Han Wudi was, was, was hoping to, to launch a battle. He was tired of having to continually pay them every year uh, tribute, uh, and uh, wanted to uh, push them out further into the steppe and take over, in particular, uh, the rich uh, Ordos uh, region. Zhang Qian has now been immortalized. There's a statue of, of Zhang Qian. Uh, almost certainly did not wear a crown, I think, at the time. Uh, but uh, uh, he has been lauded as uh, uh, a great, he uh, looks like a general, although he was, he was not a military figure. Uh, the Han campaigns against the Xiongnu are historical fact. Uh, this statue was created for one of the famous generals, Huo Chubin, uh, who uh, fought uh, uh, the, uh, the Xiongnu, and you can see from the image here, uh, the Xiongnu being trampled by a Chinese horse. So a lot of this had to do with politics uh, of uh, military uh, resources. What the Han ended up getting from the uh, Yuezhi uh, were uh, horses. They did not agree to fight together with the Han, but they did. The Han did get uh, Han Dynasty did get horses from uh, from them. Uh, maybe they looked like this. Maybe not. Uh, the uh, image here of uh, uh, the map, you can see the way that the Han expands. Uh, the, the, the yellow patch uh, shows the expansion of the Han into Central Asia uh, after the successful conclusion of the campaigns against the Xiongnu uh, in uh, uh, this uh, late second century BCE. Uh, and again, this shows the expansion of the Han into, uh, into, into Central Asia which uh, von Richthofen supposed was the beginning of, of the Silk Road. Uh, he says, well, Zhang Qian didn't succeed. He went out to try and recruit the, the, uh, the Yezhi as uh, allies. That didn't work, but he did discover that there was a market for silk. Uh, and so he inspired in the Han uh, a whole policy to uh, bring trade forward. Uh, and uh, according to von Richthofen, the empire uh, thought that all of his, his whole policy, therefore, was uh, directed at bringing about trade, greater trade between China and uh, Western <coughs> Asia. And so we get the idea of these Silk Routes. This is the, the birth of the Silk Road idea. There is some basis in truth for it, uh, but uh, as I will uh, show, uh, the question remains as to how much trade really happened on the Silk Road, uh, and uh, what really moved and what didn't. Uh, notions of the Silk Road have taken over the imagination. There are many, countless maps uh, showing the connections across all of Eurasia, of people moving on different roads. Uh, von Richthofen varied in his use of the singular or the plural to describe the Silk Roads, usually went with the, with the plural. Uh, this is a network of roads, uh, uh, according to him, uh, that uh, people followed carrying goods in large quantities, most especially silk. As it was a, a Chinese monopoly, China was the only place in the world that this kind of produced uh, silk from the silkware, Bombix Mori, uh, and so they had uh, control over that market and used that to their own trade advantage. Story that sounds a lot like some of the things we are hearing in the news again today. Camels. Uh, on the Silk Road, the notion of silk as an object of uh, great value. Silk did matter, uh, in, of course, uh, in trade on the Silk Road, such as it happened. But mostly silk was money on the Silk Road, we now know. Right? Silk was not typically something that you would buy in order to wear or to make a banner of for your temple, although you might do that sometimes. Usually silk was seen as a, and used as a store of value. And how we know that, I'll get to in just a little bit. So we have this theory, this hypothesis of von Richthofen's, 
from the 1870s. Uh, the idea is uh, floated out. It appears in an obscure academic journal. How many of us have felt having published in obscure academic journals that no one will ever, ever read? <laughs> and this article, yes, I see hands going up. We all feel that way. Uh, the article didn't get a lot of attention, in fact. Um, but von Richthofen uh, did have students, and his students began to pursue this idea. Uh, earliest and most famous was Sven Hedin, uh, an explorer and, and geographer uh, like uh, von Richthofen. Uh, he was not really an archaeologist, but he was a, a fearless uh, uh, traveler. <coughs> And uh, his uh, discovery of uh, certain uh, ruined uh, towns, uh, oasis towns, on the uh, edges of the Taklamakan Desert lent some support to his uh, teacher's uh, ideas. Uh, and he was followed by a man whose name is, of course, very well known in India, Oral Stein, uh, who uh, really was the one first to do proper archaeology and to uh, provide some put some meat on the bones of the thesis that the von Richthofen had put out about this uh, early, early, early trade routes and the existence of these oases uh, that uh, once had crisscrossed uh, Central Asia, linking China with the West. <coughs> uh, we have uh, ample evidence of uh, Stein's uh, explorations. He published everything, uh, usually in two versions, a version for the public, and then something for the academic community that was very minutely uh, uh, documented. Uh, and the objects that he uh, came, back, came back with, the texts, uh, and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, things uh, now are in museums around the world, uh, notably here uh, and in London as well. Uh, here is a photograph uh, that, he, uh, that he took. Uh, Hedin didn't have a photographer with him. Hedin liked to draw pictures, and the, the, the images we have from Hedin's are quite colorful, but Stein's pictures are actually quite useful. And Stein, of course, goes to the site of uh, the Mughal Caves in Dunhuang, uh, which became a, one of the most celebrated uh, discoveries of archaeology in the world in the first part of the 20th century. Documents found here and at other sites on the Silk Road, but most notably here, have provided most of the material that we now use to try and understand what was really going on on the Silk Road. I'll come back to that also in just a little bit. Another famous scholar whose name is inextricably associated with uh, the Silk Road is Paul Pelliot, uh, a Frenchman. Unlike Stein, Pelliot could read Chinese. Uh, and uh, he got there just a few months after uh, Stein and was uh, shown uh, the treasures of the library cave and had a, uh, as you can see here, uh, he's actually got a candle lit, which uh, every time I look at this, I think what a miracle that he didn't set all of these texts on fire. Uh, these, uh, most of these now are in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Uh, and all of the things that have been collected in Dunhuang, which are now scattered all over the world in collections from Seoul to St. Petersburg to Berlin to London, uh, are available online uh, through the International Dunhuang Project. So this material has all come to light, and this is a big part of the Silk Road story. Harvard has its own uh, small part to play in uh, the Silk Road saga. In the 1920s, the Fogg Museum, uh, which was still pretty new at the time, decided that to be a respectable museum in the world, it needed its own Silk Road material. Uh, and so, with uh, help from Oral Stein, uh, it sent uh, uh, Langdon Warner, who was the first historian of Asian art in anywhere in the United States, sent him uh, out uh, to, uh, to Dunhuang. Uh, and uh, Warner came back with uh, a few things. The, the um, bits of mural that he tried to bring back mostly uh, were wrecked, but he did bring home uh, to Cambridge, or being back to Cambridge, uh, a, a lovely statue of a needing bodhisattva. These are the photographs he took of the statue before he removed it, so we have evidence. Uh, and if you go to Dunhuang today, there's prominently uh, 
uh, featured uh, outside uh, the uh, story of the American imperialists and uh, their looting at Du uh, And uh, that's the topic for another lecture, but maybe not today. Uh, so we have, uh, I just didn't want you to think I was skirting over this part. Uh, we, have, we definitely um, have a, a role to play in bringing the Silk Road into Cambridge and using this as a, as a, as a means for teaching. And indeed, I taught a freshman seminar on the Silk Road just last fall and brought students in and we spent a good long time uh, uh, gazing at this, uh, at this beautiful statue and debating about whether it belonged in Cambridge, Massachusetts or whether in fact it belongs back in Dunhuang. Banners, uh, the murals of Dunhuang allow us to understand what moved, <coughs> music moved, we know for sure, fabrics, textiles, dance, Scripts, language, ideas, religion, all these things moved in, 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 in very significant ways, uh, really changing uh, cultures uh, forever uh, throughout the region. But again, how much commerce was there? How, much, how many goods really moved on this silk road? People have been trying to find the answers to that. Before we get to that, let me bring the Silk Road story up to the present, up to the Belt and Road Initiative. So we've got von Riesthofen, we've got Hedin and Stein and Pelio and Warner, all of that action up through, say, the 1920s. Uh, and then we have a book by Sven Hedin published in the 1930s, 1936. The Silk Road is still in print. Uh, it's the story of his great adventures uh, on, on the Silk Road. Again, it's not really a it's, it's, it's informed by some historical knowledge, but Medin was not a historian, he didn't know any Chinese uh, or any other uh, of the ancient Central Asian languages. Uh, this is a, an adventure story, an explorer's story. Sven Hedin was a rock star in the first part of the, of the 20th century, one of the most famous men in the world. Uh, so this was the beginning of the entry of the Silk Road into the popular mind in the West. The Silk Road as yet is pretty much unknown anywhere else. Fifty years pass before we get another book with Silk Road in the title. Uh, and that's uh, this book by a British journalist, journalist Peter Hopkirk, Foreign Devils on the Silk Road. It came out in 1980. It's got a chapter in here on the Dean, there's a chapter in Pelio, there's a chapter on Warner. Again, this is about the American, the British, the French, the Russian, the Japanese discovery of uh, places along the Silk Road. Uh, an, an absorbing read, to be sure. It's also in 1980 that uh, the Silk Road starts to get known in Asia, and the, the uh, event that really catalyzes this was the NHK CCTV documentary on, uh, on Dunhuang, uh, on the Silk Road, uh, or as it's known in Japanese, Shiruku Rodo. The fact that the Japanese word for the Silk Road is Shuduku Rodo should indicate to you that there is no native Japanese word for the Silk Road. This was invented to translate the English, or which was then, of course, originally from the German, uh, and similarly for the Chinese, Sicho Drilu. Uh, you can look a long time. I have. You won't find anything on the Silk Road in Chinese before 1980. It's just not an idea. It's not there. And if, if you do look, and please test my, if you can find something, please send me an email. Because I, I would love to have evidence of prior uh, uh, currency of the idea of the Silk Road in China. I have not found evidence of it. It only really starts about 40 years ago. And uh, it's certainly taken off. Uh, tourism at Dunhuang has grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, I first went to Dunhuang in 1983. In those years, about 10,000 people a year would travel to Dunhuang. You had to go by train and then by bus. There was a very primitive dormitory to stay in. It was not uh, a very, uh, uh, it was not an easy travel, which was part of the excitement of it. We could feel like we were our own mini versions of, of Oral Stein or miniature versions of, of Paul Pelio. Uh, the trip I made, uh, one of the group that uh, formed naturally on the train included a Jap young Japanese guy whose last name was Otani. 
and he was, uh, we didn't know whether he was related to the Otani of the Otani expedition, but we did notice that he, drove, he wore every day perfectly white shirt and pants. Now how he kept his shirt and pants perfectly white on a Chinese train in 1983, I've never figured that out. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was this kind of romance about the Silk Road, and the romance of the Silk Road through the documentaries, through the music that went with the documentaries uh, by Kitaro, uh, really began to seize hold of the imagination. More and more people begin to go. Uh, this creates problems for tourism, of course. Last year, nine million people visited the world. So, if this, it's like the Vatican, right? So you get this many people going into this space, eventually these caves are just going to collapse. So how to deal with this success is really uh, an issue now. Uh, you can go on your own camel rides. The stupa that is shown here at a place called Rawak, outside Khotan, was first excavated by Stein uh, in 19, oh, uh, 1908, I believe. Uh, so you can go out and, and, uh, and visit that. You can go to the silk market and buy silk in Kashgar. And nowadays, though, you have to go through a very careful security check to get in here. Or you can go uh, to the open bazaar in Khotan. Uh, the Silk Road uh, was there for you. If you can, don't like to travel or if this is too far or too expensive for you, you can travel your own Silk Road in, uh, in, in audio form. Uh, by listening to Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble, uh, which has been around now for about uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see here the idea. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma, a Harvard graduate, uh, conceived the Silk Road as a reminder uh, that uh, globalization uh, can uh, really serve as a way to tie us all together. He is also playing on the historical associations of the Silk Road, really more for its cultural valences rather than uh, economic, this has also been uh, a great uh, success. So we've got all of this now. The Silk Road is firmly implanted in our imaginations. It's firmly implanted in Xi Jinping's imagination, for sure. Uh, and uh, we are able to, thanks to all the documentation, thanks to the texts and, and, and various things that, have, that were found in Dunhuang and that have since been excavated, we are in a position now to actually understand a little bit more about what really happened on the Silk Road. Uh, and uh, some examples of the texts that inform that. Uh, here are uh, some, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, eight uh, letters, uh, the Saudian ancient letters, so-called, uh, which have been translated by Nicholas Sims Williams uh, of Soaf. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> they give us some insight into what uh, what travel was like, what the life was like. Um, people, uh, in this case, uh, a letter written from Dunhuang, put into a mail pouch to be sent home. It never got home. Uh, and uh, basically, the, the, uh, the author here is writing what so many of us write in our letters home when we're traveling abroad, please send money. <laughs> <laughs> Texts in Chinese give us some sense of uh, what people, how people understood the geography that they were living in, uh, what gets described, how far it takes, how long it takes to get to a certain place, what you need to bring with you. We have language manuals to help you manage in the marketplace uh, if you don't speak uh, uh, the local uh, lingo. Uh, and we have documents in a whole bunch of languages. We teach most of these languages at Harvard, which is kind of a nice thing. Uh, here, uh, uh, Chinese Cotanese bilingual document for the sale of uh, a camel. Out of all of this, we are now putting together a picture uh, that uh, suggests that, in fact, there was not a whole lot of trade on the Silk Road. And the trade that did happen on the Silk Road mostly didn't involve silk. Uh, goods moved on the Silk Road, to be sure. They were mostly uh, in, in small numbers uh, and uh, uh, traveling uh, usually relatively short distances. This we find uh, first uh, put forward in work by Valerie Hansen at, at Yale. Uh, but other scholars uh, from uh, different, uh, different parts of the world, uh, here uh, from, uh, from Japan, the old Tibetan texts in the Stein collection, these were texts in Tibetan, because Tibet controlled Dunhuang for a number of decades, so there are a lot of Tibetan materials uh, in Dunhuang. 
uh, Persian scholar, uh, The Road That Never Was, uh, The Silk Road and Trans-Eurasian Exchange, this piece from a couple of years ago, uh, a recent entry in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia. Powerful nomad groups extorted enormous amounts of silk from the Chinese and redistributed them. Uh, in this scenario, the Han was at best an involuntary and reluctant facilitator of the intercontinental silk trade. This is the opposite of what von Riesthofen argues. That, in fact, economics was totally incidental, according to the research that we have now, totally incidental to the opening of the Silk Road, and there is no such thing really as the opening of the Silk Road. Uh, the Silk Road for the Han, the connections with West Asia for the Han, were all about getting political and military allies for von Richthofen as well, the Silk Road was about geographical connections powered by political uh, dynamics. And this, in fact, is what the documents tend to show. So in a recent dissertation written by a, a former student of mine who is now a member of the Department of History and East Asian Languages at Princeton, seems that most of the goods that moved on back and forth on the Silk Road were, in fact, gifts. There were gifts between princes, there were gifts between kings, uh, they were diplomatic, they were parts of a, a, an extensive diplomatic network. So yes, we have movement of ideas, yes, we have movement of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of artistic traditions and, and of scripts and so forth, <coughs> but we don't have a lot of actual commerce happening on uh, the Silk Road. So if the historical Silk Road was not primarily about silk, as it now seems to be, and it wasn't really primarily about commerce and trade then, what was the Silk Road about? Well, it turns out that the Silk Road was really about diplomacy and about geopolitics. Both in von Richthofen's conceptualization of what the Silk Road was, and in terms of the historical facts that we are able to develop, whether it has to do with the opening of uh, relations between the Han and the Yuezhi in the second century BCE and Zhang Tian, or whether it has to do with the movement uh, of uh, uh, the opening of a uh, movement of people back and forth on the Silk Road during, say, the seventh through eleventh uh, centuries, which is when the bulk of the documents that we have from Dun Huang uh, come from. In all of those cases, uh, really, the Silk Road is about uh, geopolitics. And in that way, the new Silk Road actually does make a lot of sense. Because this is what the Belt and Road Initiative really is about, I think. Uh, and so I would say that uh, insofar as uh, uh, the old Silk Road was about some trade, but really more about uh, connections between states and about positioning of, uh, of, of political power, then it has a lot to do with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that we are witnessing uh, as it unfolds uh, today. Here a photograph uh, from uh, the Belt and Road Forum held in Beijing in, in May 2017, again very closely associated with uh, the person of uh, President uh, Xi Jinping. I don't know if he personally approved this particular logo, but this is from, <laughs> from Chinese television. Uh, so, as I say, uh, we've got the idea of the Silk Road, a romantic notion, the revival of trade routes. Uh, the trade routes that are being made today, uh, the uh, infrastructure that is being built today is in, is, is in no way really being built on historical precedent. The political connections, however, the geopolitical strategy that is going into thinking about the Belt and Road, however, does have ample precedent in history. And with that, I will draw to a close, and thank you very, very much for your attention. <laughs>